Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator, Cindy Elliott, who's going to lead the plenary of women in supply chain. Cindy, it's all yours. Great. Well, thank you, Wink, and thanks, everybody, for being here today. Uh, my name is Cindy Elliott. I'm with Esri. We are one of the uh, proud sponsors here at the conference and the summit. Um, I'm also one of uh, the board members on the Center for the Randall Kendrick Global Supply Chain Institute. Uh, and a pleasure to be here today before we get started and I want to introduce my, our co-panelists. We do have two virtual that should be looking to, to sign in or join, otherwise we're going to have a great time, the three of us. Um, you might see that I modified our title today a little bit. Um, in doing our panel preparation and looking at some additional research, we really wanted to shine a light on what's happening and maybe some gaps that still need some attention around women and diversity. So with that, um, I've introduced myself briefly. I have 20 years experience in supply chain and distribution. Uh, I've been based in California most of my life, but lived around Boston, South America, and traveled extensively in that role. Um, what inspires me today about supply chain, I think we've already started to hear about it, is that it has never been a more exciting time to affect real change, not only in our operations, but in the makeup of our workforce for supply chain. And next I'd like to start by introducing um, to my left here, uh, Sue Sundar from the University of Utah. And Sue, would you give us a few highlights of your career and what inspires you today? Great, thank you, Cindy. And thank you for having us here um, in this panel session. I'm Sue Sundar, I'm a professor at the University of Utah School of Business. And I'm also the director of the um, Operations and Supply Chain Program at the University of Utah. And um, I'm delighted to be here at USC. It's such a beautiful campus. And thanks to Nick for organizing this amazing um, event. And um, uh, did, what else did we have to inspire? Just, what um, inspires you? What inspires me? Yes, I think um, I just feel like um, I feel lucky to be in the right profession. Um, you know, I can't think of doing anything other than being a professor in my field because I get to meet young talent every day in my life. Uh, I wake up in the morning and I'm able to share my passion for operations and supply chain and um, uh, we've had speakers today and one of the things that we've realized is, especially the last week, we talked about how every news channel out there has supply chain as one of the top things they're talking about and this is really the foundation for every business. Uh, all the wonderful businesses that we have here, all the great leaders who are sitting with us today, you would agree that Operation Supply Chain is the foundation for our businesses and that's what keeps us alive and kicking. And if that's missing from our business, we wouldn't be around as businesses. We wouldn't be able to compete. And I think what gives me excitement every day of my life is to be able to meet students like you guys here from our USC. I see wonderful students in our, in our audience and it's students like you that make our, our lives as, as professors meaningful because we're able to impart our passion for this field to you who are the future leaders of the business world. So thank you again for having us. And further to our left is Seema Gupta. Seema, a few words about your highlights in career and, and inspiration? Sure, sure, happy to. Well, first, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with all of you and um, for you giving some of your precious time to be here. So a little bit about myself. I hail from the industry. Uh, I've spent 20 plus years in the supply chain and operations space, um, largely in high tech. So many years at Hewlett Packard running supply chain optimization, then at Tesla helping to ramp the Model 3 uh, supply chain, then at Startup Bird Rides leading out global supply chain, um, and then in advisory, supply chain advisory at Gartner, and then most recently I just joined um, Amazon's supply chain optimization technologies organization. So very excited to share some of the experiences that um, I've had and be part of this panel. In terms of what inspires, so one, and you've probably all noticed this, we don't have to explain what supply chain is anymore, do we? <laughs> Everyone knows what it is when you go to those dinner parties, when you see family members, at least they know that it's 
full of challenges. So in terms of inspiration, I think right now it's an incredible time for the supply chain profession. Obviously, the challenges are just flat out immense, which makes it a really attractive area for smart minds, creative thinkers, and we have, we're at an age where we have so much data, analytics, and technology that we have the options, we have the possibility of coming up with some really creative and boundary pushing solutions to what we're facing today. So I think that's very exciting and I think everyone should consider um, an opportunity or a, one of our supply chain challenges and work in this profession. Well, thank you. And I see one of our virtual panelists is with us, Hannah. Hannah Kane, do you want to give us a little bit of your um, highlights in your supply chain career and what inspires you today? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for, uh, for inviting me to the panel. panel. And, uh, I'm, I'm excited, excited to be here, here and, uh, and uh, to be with, with uh, these fabulous panelists. So, uh, uh, I was uh, born in Denmark and uh, came to the U.S. in 1990 and 1994 and landed in Silicon Valley and that's where I still am. I love it here. And uh, what um, I'm doing is I'm the president and CEO of Elon. Elon is a global supply chain company. We work and operate out of 19 locations globally. And um, we, we work with the, in, in the technology field, of course, automotive, medical, and uh, very regulated industries, doing both the physical, the digital, and the financial supply chain. And, and what I, I think, I, think I, I agree with the panelists, there's so much to be excited about in the supply chain today. When, when we founded Elon, one of the visions was, can we, do a, can we form a supply chain company that does right by everybody in the supply chain? Uh, and that is both the, the employees, it's the suppliers, it's the suppliers, suppliers, it's the overall community, and of course the, 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 the customers. And so today that's more important than ever, that, that entire ecosystem and doing right by everybody. The other thing I'm excited about is can we be part of the bigger solutions? So here as COVID has been wrecking havoc on, on our community, we have had the opportunity to do COVID test kits. So we produce and ship COVID test kits. And if you're, if you're especially in California, but actually uh, throughout the US, if you got a COVID test, very likely it came from one of our facilities. And, and it's been very, very gratifying to be able to be part of such a big, big, big uh, solving such a big problem. Great, Hannah. And our last panelist, probably the most distant around you, would you like to introduce yourself? Some highlights. Um, you can see here on the screen, she's a CEO of an Australian-based organization and wanted you to introduce yourself. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, um, good afternoon, I'm Rianne Jerome, CEO and founder of Catarsal Facetech. A technology media that's focused on developing cutting-edge cutting supply, supply chain solutions. Um, I have been in the supply chain industry, industry for over 15 years, years. and my, my passion lies in the gap of, of fragment solutions in supply chain traceability. Uh, to address problems such as product and food safety, biosecurity, product provenance, uh, brand, brand protection, protection, environmental and sustainability issues, and many, many other challenges, challenges that is faced by the supply chain industry. I have, I have the pleasure of joining you from Melbourne, Australia, Australia and it is 5 a.m. in the morning. Um, <laughs> so if, if I fall asleep, I apologize. <laughs> but I, I hope that today I'm able to convince our audience why they should consider a career in supply chain. And, and um, it, it's also helped them change uh, some of the minds and the limited beliefs that are around supply chain and what it means for. I'd, I'd also like to thank you, as Marshall, Marshall um, for, for inviting me to join this great team of women in supply chain. Great. Thank you, Riaju. Um, before we get started on the panel conversation, I wanted to tee up some subjects that we wanted to really focus on today, um, and we were provided some reference material both from Gartner and the Awesome Group, and I'll also quote some McKinsey and Company. And what you'll see here is Gartner really 
Is it possible to show the slides up on, on the screen? Um, Gardner states right now in this research that the female workforce and supply chain is really crucial for two reasons. And, and you can see the word diversity in here as well is that women are what they refer to as underutilized resources in the war for talent. And I would say all of our diverse workforce is probably a, a huge under, untapped resource here. And these diverse teams tend to be more innovative and perform better. And secondly, you know, women make up approximately 50% of the workforce. That number is actually growing globally. And the organizations who you know, effectively hire, develop, and retain that talent have a long-term competitive advantage. And those are the things we all have been talking about here already today. So the big number. The big number is that today 41% of the supply chain workforce is comprised of women. That's up 4% from 2016. And that's a good number. And actually, this is the most resilient industry throughout COVID to maintain the number and the, and the percentage of women in the workforce and other industries declined during COVID for a variety of different reasons. So very resilient here. But despite that nice kind of incremental increase of women in the workforce, we really still see three persistent challenges. Building the pipeline for leadership. And we're gonna look at some graphs about this and we're gonna talk about it today, so I won't spend time here but addressing other distinct diversity challenges across roles and then mid-career departures from supply chain, maybe not necessarily as a whole, but moving from company to company and not retaining that talent uh, that's so um, in, important. So this is a, these are, at the very end of the slides, I show the two reports that this data came from, so you'll be able to Google it. Um, overall, the representation of women in the workforce, you can see here, um, has a downward trajectory, and that really hasn't changed. Is that me? Over five years. <laughs> Over five years, and, and especially in the more senior roles, you can see it continues to decline. This is a McKinsey and Company uh, chart. I know there's a lot of information on here, but this also shines a light not only on women in the workforce, but women of color in the workforce. And at the, when you get to the SVP and the C-suite, over the whole workforce, not just supply chain, you're looking at 4% of women in color in C-suite roles. And that number actually shrinks to 1% in supply chain. So this is women of color, Latin, black, and, and Asia Pacific. So that is something that we have to like be consciously uh, aware of. So what makes a difference? So this is also from Gartner. This is consumer, industrial, life sciences, and supply chain arenas. You can see the companies and the organizations that make specific management scorecards and specific management goals are the dark blue. And supply chain is not last, but they're not, they're not first either. And that there's a general blue, middle blue area that, oh yeah, it's an objective. Right? And we're, we're working toward it, but they haven't stated management scorecards or management compensation based on these. So I, I feel like there's a real focus that needs to be applied to actually you know, making these things measurable um, across the pipeline. And for the last statement, we talked about the lack of career opportunities uh, in the workforce for women um, and why are they leaving their jobs? Why are they leaving to go to other industries? Why are they leaving to go to other country or companies right when they've got the experience and the value contr contributions to make? Why are they exiting? And you might have assumed they were exiting for other things, but they're exiting because of better career opportunities somewhere else. And secondly, because they are looking for development opportunities. So this is, uh, goes back and addresses a bit of that middle pipeline. Like what are companies doing to be methodical and precise and systematic about building the women talent, the diversity talent, and making sure you're retaining those because those are the talent that brings innovation, performance, and competitive advantage. Um, these are the two uh, documents that I mentioned. They're on Google. Uh, they're free of charge, the 2021 supply, Women in Supply Chain Research and Women in the Workplace um, at McKinsey and Company. So I just thought that was good kind of ground setting and we can now move back into our discussion. And if we could bring our, our virtual ease, who, did, who called them Zoomies earlier today? Was that Jeff? Zoomies. Can we bring our Zoomies back in? Uh, so I wanted to start today uh, and maybe start with a big number, right? We are seeing progress 
in women in supply chain. And I'll start with Hannah, that you know, not only do we see the number growing, but there was a gr great resilience of women in supply chain during COVID. What are you seeing as these leading indicators of why um, we are seeing this forward movement? Well, this, we, 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 we do have a talent, talent crisis, crisis, right? And, 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 and that, that talent crisis is just uh, driving, driving uh, um, the, the, the need to, to uh, have a more open mind about what does a, 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 a supply chain executive look like? Right. Right. And, 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 and so, so if you go back historically, we have had these preconceived not, uh, notions about how does a, a supply chain professional uh, look, what, what, what's the gender, what's the age, etc. And I think that is opening up because we have a talent crisis. And this is good news for everybody in the audience, or especially the students, right? That, that Yes, yes, we, we, we need, need bodies, bodies, but we, we more than bodies, bodies, we need talent. talent. And, and so, so I think in, in this situation where supply chain is really in crisis, both talent-wise and otherwise, you know, system-wise, uh, 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 being able to deliver, we, we, we need uh, everybody on deck. And when I say everybody on deck, it's... Uh, Lots of research show that the more diverse teams you have, the more success you'll have, the better solutions you have. And so women and men bring different things to the party. Uh, not all women bring mainly the female things and more, not all men bring mainly the male things, but generally women tend to be more collaborative. And, and and right now we are uh, we need that collaboration to be able to succeed. We also need a very holistic thinking where we are having the focus that many men bring to the the party and the collaboration that women bring to the party. And then we need to have this thinking about how do we, as I mentioned in in in, in my introduction, how do we do right by everybody in the supply chain? Because we are we have we have uh, certainly procurement has become very strategic, and we need to have that collaboration. We need to pull in the suppliers and be a very integral part of our supply chain uh, in a different manner. So uh, so that stakeholder analysis that ability to work together and then of course the corporate social responsibility right that has raised uh, that consumers are way more conscious about what's going on behind the scenes they want to do business with corporations that do the right thing by the employees and by everybody in the supply chain that don't pollute that are uh, sustainable and so that entire perspective and thinking through those implications i think that's where where uh, the holistic approach where we get everybody involved both women men uh, different, different races and, and different backgrounds, and, and, and we collaborate. That's, that's more important, important than ever. Thank you, Hannah. So open the conversation to our other panelists. And Rianju, I want to give you a chance to, to weigh in if you'd like to. I know you were a big proponent of this is about the positivity of, of, of the movement, not necessarily, you know, um, what's the word, punishing those that aren't, you know, kind of not trying to draw negative metrics here. What are, what are your observations? So, um, first, I'm, I'm very proud to say that 75% of my workforce is, is women. And, and that is not because I am, you know, it's not, not just about gender equality or giving women opportunity. It's about finding the right talent that is the support in helping grow my business for success. But it's also about the that I'm wanting to add value in, in the supply chain industry. I think one, one of the one of the problems um, that, that I've seen in, in the industry is, is the limiting belief about supply chain. When, when you talk to supply chain about supply chain, a lot of people still think that it's about automatically the mind goes to just am I transporting things from A to E? Yeah. Is it you no? Know, am, am I going to be truck driver? They, they don't realize that almost if you know, really every industry is a supply chain component in. Right. Across the so career, career you, you, your career opportunities or um, the, the roles that you can play in the supply chain is not just limited um, 
imply that, that the this is a even the supply chain is very diverse industry, so there's multiple roles that have been played. So I think it let you go of the liberty of belief, whether you're a male or a female, because this is, as I mentioned, this is not about gender, it is about the beliefs within supply chain that we, we need to change that mindset. I know, I know that we've come a long way in supply chain, we still haven't reached really the point. We supply chain nowhere, you know, as long as we exist. It is going, going to be part of our everyday life. life. Supply chain is that we're buying online. That you know, there's every industry with it, pharma, manufacturing. There's, there's different roles within that that plays the supply chain part. But I think it's it's, it's focusing on that, and then when people look at that, go, well, hang on. There's so many things that are happening in supply chain, and I could contribute because I need to see your career. But 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 also. Uh, you know that we we all focus on um the, the, the we, we talk about the limit. I know I saw in Gartner the limiting opportunities that we have around uh, for women in terms of career succession. And it's also about mentorship. Are we providing the right mentorship to women? Are we guiding all men and women? Are we providing them the right guidance? If I look at all the industry statements um in how women are represented in uh, leadership roles. The supply chain solution is, is the most, most underrepresented. So I am sitting here thinking, well, I'm the one of the most underrepresented in that, uh, that uh, product research. But, but I also know that, that even though I am a minority, I'm making a great difference to, to the industry. And, and it's that, that mindset that, 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 that you know, you know, we, we need, need to adopt to, to be able to uh, contribute to the role of uh, women in supply chain and get them into roles and into leadership. Thanks, Cindy. No, thank you. Thank you. So one of the things that I would like to say here is, um, you know, the consistent theme that we're talking about here is, I think I see two problems. One is attraction of talent. How do we attract the right talent? And the number two problem I see here is, how do we retain that talent and help them grow, right? And so from a professor's perspective and also the director's perspective, since I'm the director of our program, and one of the things that I, you know, that I see consistently, I see students, so I run both the undergraduate and the master's, I'm, I'm involved both in the master's level and the undergraduate level as well. So I see students as early as their first semester in college. So I teach a class, uh, which is called Business Scholars, and I, te I see them literally starting their first week out of high school in college, their first week of college, right? And if I, when I'm talking to a in a class of students, say I'm talking to a class of 50 students, and I ask them, how many of you have heard about operations and supply chain? You won't believe, I hardly get one hand. One hand, and so, and if I get one hand, I'm really happy. Sometimes I get zero hands for how many of you have heard of operations supply chain. And I ask them, what do you guys want to major in? 75% of the students say finance. The rest 25% choose marketing or accounting or management. I don't get anyone in my class saying that they want to do operations supply chain. So my problem or my solution to this problem starts with first finding the right talent and getting them into our field, into the, into the world of operations supply chain and getting them to realize, because like our panelists talked about, when we talk about operations supply chain, most of the time when we say supply chain, they, they're thinking about shipping containers and right. boxes, trucks. Trucks. right? And trucks. No one wants to be in a job that deals with shipping containers and boxes and trucks. That's not sexy enough, right? <laughs> finance is very attractive. And that's why they think finance is all about money. I'm going to be rolling in dollars and dollar bills and I'm going to be thinking about that all day. Well, let me break something to you. If you really want to roll in money and you want to help your company make more money, operations and supply chain is the way to go because we are the foundation of a business. This is where we create new money. Finance is not where you create new money. This is where we create efficiencies. This is where we improve quality. This is where we reduce costs. And that's what our students don't know. And my journey with my students starts with the first semester. I see them, and once they get into my major, because I'm the director, I'm able to see them all the way through their graduation, and then I see them back in my master's programs. And what I wanna say is that we wanna start young. 
We want them, the right talent, these students who don't know what operations supply chain is, we want to attract them early on into our programs and then get them into our job field. So one of the things that I work with as being a director of program is working on capstones, which is connecting with top companies like Starbucks and Amazon and, you know, and, and PepsiCo. And we're working with these top companies to get our, our star students to say, our star operations supply chain students into these top companies. But then I, I pass on the baton to you where you have to find and make sure that these, not only women, but I want to speak for men as well. I want to say that we want to get the right talent, both men and women and of people of all genders and make sure that they have the mentorship to be able to carry them through their workforce. And as Cindy talked about, that, that downward sl sloping sl you know, line where we see women or the right talent diminishing as we see them you know, starting off high in terms of percentages, but then slowly diminishing in terms of percentages as they move along and move up in the, in, within their companies. And so that's why we need mentorship. So I see this problem as far as retaining the talent or attracting the talent, but then most importantly, retaining, retaining that talent and making sure, as Cindy talked about, making sure that these talented men and women don't switch careers or move out because they don't have the right mentorship. And that's where leaders like you, we have so many leaders in our audience today. We need your help to be those that mentor and help the right talent move on into your, into your companies. So you want to add anything at this point? Yeah, to just, just a small, but there were so many great points that we've hit on <laughs> over the course of this question. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll build off of one thing you said, Sue. Right? Just the understanding of supply chain, almost the marketing element of it, the, the attraction of the supply chain space, right? Often there is a perception that supply chain is really, you know, it's a straight science. Um, it's all about the math, it's all about the numbers, and no doubt that's a huge component of it. But in my experience, it's really an art and a science in that at any given point, what you're solving for can change, right? You have massive supply chains and it's all about solving for scale. You have very small startups and it's all about speed and how you can craft as much of a creative solution as possible. Um, textbooks will tell you one thing that you need to really try to focus on reducing your product offering or your SKU selection. But I think we know as customers that's not really what we want, right? So there's so many factors that need to be balanced. I think it's important that we start sort of showing the whole sort of range um, of skills that supply chain encompasses. And hopefully that helps with some of the attraction and can really link up well to different types of skill sets. I think there was a statistic uh, that was shared in the board room yesterday that graduating master's students, is it 7,500 or 70? 7,500, Carl, a year across the U.S. And, and that's just the U.S. markets. And, and we have, it's a global uh, network, and there's just not enough people coming in to this field. And so I think that's the, the one thing, and, and I think our focus is how do we expand and really focus that attraction on kind of the diverse workforce population. And because I think that also is a population that hasn't felt as much inclusion, right, or as in the evidence there. But so I think to, to, to bridge here, you know, that's the attraction. And we talked a little bit about mentoring and coaching, but there's a, a hard fact that leadership is in the pipeline leadership for women in diversity and supply chain is not meeting the market potential and the market demand. So I'd really like to drill a little bit on Tac very tactical, like what are, what are real actions that you would recommend that firms can take, that individuals can take to build that, that talent pipeline because, or that leadership pipeline? Because I feel like just saying we need it isn't strong enough action. And um, I might start, Rianju, with you uh, this time, being a CEO and 75% of your workforce is women. Like you said, you're not necessarily measuring the women leadership, you're measuring just leadership and development. What are some real tactical things you see in your organization and in the industry that affect the real change of that leadership development, not just uh, kicking the can? 
dovetail off of your point, Hannah, around visibility, right? Hannah described one type of visibility, actually seeing female board members, seeing leaders at the upper echelons of company. But 
there are many types of visibility. So for me, in, in my experience, to me, it seems that visibility is sort of a key point, whether it is through goals, through values and principles of an organization, but really something that very openly underscores that this is an important topic in our workplace, right? Many different forms, so this is important. And that would be one component. The other component I would see is um, the inbound pipeline, okay? So as you're hiring, right? There's a lot of growth in supply chain these days. So as you're hiring, how do you make sure that you're bringing in diverse talent? And we talked about the scarcity of talent already, but there are, there are no, you asked about more tactical things. What are some of those more tactical things that can be done? You know, take a hard look at where you're recruiting from, which universities, does it have to be universities, for experienced hires, where are you looking, how do you put some more method to that? Even the sort of interview panels and the selection process, how do you introduce diversity right there? You know, it's, it's not difficult since you're gonna run a candidate through a set of interviewers anyways. You can very easily integrate diverse sort of diverse interviewers. Uh, it's a straightforward to do. So those are very tactical things from an inbound perspective or a pipeline person, inbound pipeline. And then I, I think of the last piece as it's not the or another key piece really as once you have this talent in, now what? Right? And that's what we've started talking about. How do we make sure that we have an environment conducive to inclusion. How do we go about finding mentorship? You know, is it mentorship that's needed? Is it something stronger like advocacy? Uh, depending on the culture of the organization, it, the tactics may change and may be different, but it seems like these challenges are pervasive, right? How, how do you help with creating the right type of environment to help with advancement? Right? What does that look like? And it's not just the individuals, right? The, the diverse individuals, but it's the, it's the environment around them as well. So all of that needs to be sort of thoughtful, up-leveled, and in a way, architected. And I think just simple, sometimes simple awareness of what the, that you're trying to do. Being comfortable saying out loud, you know, we're looking for, you know, diversity, we're looking for inclusion in our hiring process, and this is why. And often it's like this sharing and creating an awareness across the organization that there are gaps, but there's also missions and goals towards that thing. So often if you're not sharing across teams, the, the objective of diversity and inclusion, they don't think to put it into their hiring mindsets, right, or their, their promotional mindsets. I talked to a, a, a colleague just recently who you know, was, didn't receive the promotion and the advancement she had anticipated and it went to a non-female and it was disillusioning, you know, and, and it creates that goal to like, well, then I need to leave, right? And I think that's what organizations, if you can just kind of settle in and get intentional about this, this mindset, um, it, 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 stop, it keeps that talent with you. So I don't, I don't want to, Right, yeah, right. No, I, I think all of you brought up really important points here, and Hannah talked about leadership, um, and I agree with her. I think, um, you know, I talk a lot, I, I, one of the um, courses that I teach is quality management, and I talk a lot about Edwards Deming. Um, you know, he was a quality guru back during World War II. Um, he, was, he was a veteran, and he was, he was um, you know, he, he loved our country, and, and one of the things he really believed in was quality. But one of the, you know, after, after, and he was uh, involved very much with the Japanese quality movement. Uh, for those of us, you know, um, uh, who are, uh, you know, if you've read about Deming, you know that, you know, the whole Japanese um, in the 1970s and 80s when we had, uh, you know, especially car, the automotive industry, when we had these Japanese cars flooding our market with uh, better fuel mileage and, and better features. And, 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 and Deming had a lot to do with that. And he being an American, it was sad that, you know, when he was in America, uh, we, we didn't really listen to what he was saying about those quality things, um, but, but the Japanese did, and they, and they incorporated what, what he was talking about uh, in terms of the quality principles. But, but I think going back to Hannah's point, uh, you know, one of the things that Deming would not, when he, when he came back to the United States after having, living in, after having lived in Japan for a few years, 
uh, one of the things that he would refuse to be a consultant for companies is where the CEO or the upper leadership was not involved. Because he said, if your leadership is not involved, I'm not gonna get involved with you because you really need leadership involved to be able to make any concrete changes in your organization. And you know what we we're talking about, you know, for those of you uh, who are, who've, who've grown in your organizations, you understand that you, know, you need leadership to be involved, to be able to make that culture that we talked about, the environment. Environment and culture is a huge part of your growth that, that actually helps you grow, helps your talent grow in the right direction. And, and we need that. And, and, and I think we need, uh, we, we, we need uh, leadership in every gender, you know, not just women and men, but we need everybody there uh, cheering on and, and somebody that we can turn to as we're growing in our organization, who do we turn to for, for advice? Um, having this open conversation and not being afraid to speak up, and that's important. And so, so I think, um, you know, thanks for um, our panelists for bringing up all these important points today. Very good. So one thing I, as we've been talking about, I also think about during um, the past year, especially watching several different CEOs, uh, Chip Berg from Levi Strauss comes to mind, uh, something that he talked about was that they've, they've created the big number. Oh, here's the percentage of our workforce that's diverse and, and, and gender female oriented. And it was a big number, but when they, they really took the time and energy to drill into that, that whole, all the roles across other, other things, and they found that a lot of their black and brown population was in the warehouse, and they're in, in distribution and in, in some of the retail. And when they, the closer they got to the C-suite and the board, the more white it became, the more male dominant it became. And this was a company who had been for years measuring themselves against metrics, but they, they learned they had to put a different lens on it. And I think the intentionality of that um, and him talking about it on you know, Squawk Box uh, raise it, and I know other many, many other firms that are starting to do the same thing. And I think that, as you mentioned, I think Hannah was talking about, it helps pull things up, right? When you get leadership and at the, the highest level, they're, they're willing to have the conversation and expose the, the gaps. I think that's a, a critical element to, to create that, that pipeline. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left. I think it's really important to grow that mid-level. And there's nothing wrong with starting in the warehouse. I want to say that as long as you get opportunities to connect and go those opportunities. So one of the problems, for, especially for women, but probably also racially, is do you get the switch assignments? Are, they, are, they, are, they, are you getting these opportunities that are out there? And so research shows that women are not getting the switch assignments because there's some innate things going we don't want to see women fail. Well, failure is a part of growing your career, so you need to get those straight stretch assignments. And, you know, I'm saying this also to the men in the audience who are like, why are we talking about this thing with females all the time? And, 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 and you know, they have all these opportunities. And, and, and other men who are saying, what can I do? Well, one of them is to get female stretch assignments. And, and say, say you, you know, know, help them, them support them, them but, but, but also saying, saying it's okay if you fail. And, and the, the other thing is, of course, that when you look at how are we valuing women and their contribution, women are judged more harshly in some, in some areas. And I think it's very important that we pull in the research and we, 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 we think about the actual research that's being done, such as women are in a very, very narrow band of communications. So women will be written up one year on uh, uh, being too, too direct and, 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 and saying too, too much in meetings and being being too forthright. And, and, and the next year, they will be written up on being too shy and not saying too much in, in, much in meetings. And, and it's because we have this very narrow band that we allow women to operate within. It's, uh, so thinking about those type of things as, as, as you go, go through, performance evaluations and things like that. And, and then, then I think also thinking about, about we, a lot of corporations have employee resource groups, 
but, but are they being used right? right? And and so, so women, women are in this weird situation, weird situation where, where if a woman, woman asks for some, something, something for themselves, themselves they are seen as very egoistical. If, if women, women ask for something for somebody else, else they are seen as very a very good advocate, a very good friend, etc. So, so how, how can we use that psychology to help women, women, women go, go forward? So, so lots, lots of opportunities, I think, for everybody to contribute. One, One actionable item, item that uh, you asked for, for an actionable, uh, actionable item, uh, Cindy, is for everybody to mentor some, somebody who doesn't look like themselves. So, 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 so when you choose mentorship, choose somebody who's not, who doesn't look like you. That's an excellent, Thank you, excellent point, Hannah. So, I, Cindy, we had a uh, question submitted by the audience. Oh, if your lovely. panel could handle this one. Uh, and using the Whova app, so use the Whova app if, uh, for future panels Thank if you, you have Cindy. questions. How do companies incentivize their leadership to create these leadership pipelines for women and diverse groups? So, th there are a question came in. I, I lost them. Yeah, yeah, I, I cannot hear yeah, anything. Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. No, but they me off. <laughs> yes. So Wink just read a question from the audience. So I think you lost the the audio. Thank you, Wink. So um, give everyone. So before I'll ask the question again, um, but I also want all of the panelists to be thinking about your closing closing thoughts uh, as we uh, kind of address this next. And and then what is that? Uh, those, those closing thoughts, but the question from the, the audience came in that how do companies incentivize their leadership to create these um, kind of growth and, and opportunity pipelines for women in diverse groups uh, in, in supply chain, right? So what are some of those incentives that you think organizations or maybe you've seen implemented yourselves uh, in in your organizations. Sue, are you seeing anything from industry coming forward? Yes, so I think one of the things that we talked about this morning in our meeting is that, you know, your bottom line. And so one of the research that um, that we, we looked at this morning was that, that teams and companies that are more diverse do have better outcomes. I mean, they've done that study, right? So it's like your numbers speak for that. So as a CEO or as a COO or as a CFO of your company, you want your numbers to be better, right? At the end of the day, we want to make more profits. We want to see more money coming to our company. And what better way than the statistics that show us already that the more diverse your pool is, and like Hannah said, find somebody who doesn't look like you, right? Somebody else who, who's, who looks different than you and, and, and can bring a different talent than you into the firm. And you can see that that is actually better for your firm in terms of the bottom line, in terms of the profits. And I think that would be a great way to be motivate our leaders and say, look, this is going to actually mean that your stock prices are going to go up. And I would add also in terms of the customer, right? If we, if you think about your landscape of customers from a business perspective, it's always really resonated with me. Wouldn't you want for the diversity of your customer base to be somewhat reflected in the diversity of your workforce? Yeah, as you, um, so the question, have you seen incentives kind of in corporate America about becoming more diverse? In, um, um, I, 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 I wouldn't speak, speak for corporate America, America, but I would speak for corporate Australia, where the East and the West have a incentivize with you know, a, a management to, 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 to have more women. My but this, but one of the key things that, that um, we, we and, and as, as women, we sometimes know, and, 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 and I would I'd say, say some of the greatest uh, challenge that we women have for the skills that we have that is critical, critical to survive in is about multitasking, communication, collaboration, interview. That is something that women always be better uh, than men in around those, those skill sets. And with supply chain, so if you are enabling anybody in the organization, whether it's a, if it's respectful of gender, that, that you're in, in, in enabling them and empowering them and, and demonstrating sort of it, it all comes down from top down, down, down approach. Is that if I'm enabling my, my team leads, my leaders, lead and my, my managers, um, that, that you, you know, I'm giving them the right skill set to ensure that I have got 
Plus, Plus the tanks that at this level need to be at, at this level next year because they, they are going to be the key person for this customer. This customer. This customer. So, so I've already set goals, goals and objectives, and, and I can, you know, I have to make sure that they are, you know, you know they're learning the skill set that are critical to supply, supply chain, which is, uh, as I mentioned, it, it is about the, the multitasking, the communication, the collaboration, um, and, and influencing. So, so everybody has a role in influencing each other. In, 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 and that's uh, not just if we talk about the incentive, a lot of people often think that, that the incentive is, has, has to do everything to do with the money, but it's not about the financial incentive. It's the other incentive. And enabling, I have a thing within my organization where there is a picture of the profit that is needed with the staff, and it's not treated based on the role of your seniority with your organization. So, so that makes a huge difference because everybody feels equal within the organization through the, the and understand the kind of bonuses and things that are associated with um, across the board. Okay. So, so I see, I see there's a it's a it's about survival. If you don't do it, you die. I, I do believe I'm a dinosaur. So, 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 so I don't know that we really need to incentivize it. And, and so, so you'll see organizations, organizations who suffer, suffer and have, have a big uh, problem attracting talent, uh, maintaining talent, uh, and maintaining a uh, functional uh, corporate culture, and uh, they will just suffer. And, uh, and I, and I don't think we need to incentivize it anymore. So I, I'll close on a comment myself and then ask our panelists to, for a closing uh, you know, um, advice. But, one thing I would say here is incentive might be, I think what we're saying might be the wrong word. Like you don't want to financially reward somebody for doing the what should be common and, and standard practice. But I would say measure. Like the best thing to do is really measure and put the, the time and energy into measuring where your organizations are, where the diversity is, where are the gaps, and, and, and publicly disclose that. And we talked earlier about consumers wanting to know where products are originating and where products are coming from today. We also should be asking, are our um, manufacturers, are our brands diversifying not only their workforce, are they diversifying their supply chains, right? Are they protecting and ensuring quality of life and quality of, of education and fair and safe trade practices in the countries in which they serve? So I feel like we'll talk a little bit more about that and, on the sidebar if you'd like at some point. But I think we, as consumers and, and the, the wallets, have a voice um, to pressure these organizations. And these organizations that we want to work with should be you know, kind of excited about sharing their, where they're at on their journey. And I think that's something, you know, maybe it's not incentives, but measurements, the tools, the technology, the resources are there for companies to do it. So to close out, I'd ask my panelists all to say, kind of share, what do they know today that they wish they would have known earlier in their career that has kind of helped uh, influence where they're at? So what would they have liked to have known uh, early in their career that helped them get where they're at today? And um, Hannah, I'll start with you. Uh, where, where would you? Uh, uh, I'd, I'd say, say uh, I would start with solve, solve the big problems. problems. Always hire the best staff, staff and, and be yourself, yourself be authentic. authentic. Bring, Bring your whole self to any situation and, and be, be, be uh, aligned with your values, values at all times. Thank you. Nianju, how about yourself? Um, I, 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 I'm very, very proud to say, say that I've never limited, limited myself in the area. I've always, always had a goal. I, I did not. not come into the you know into the industry or get into free to say that I was going to fail at something. I believe in myself. And, and that would be my key message. What you believe in yourself, no matter who you are, what your identity is, is what ethnicity you come out from, believe in yourself, set a goal, and then you achieve who you want. Okay. Sima? Yeah, I, I agree with being authentic. I think early on, sometimes it's difficult to know what authentic is. Um, and then once you figure out, it's hard to be authentic. But being authentic, uh, that really paves the way for much more transparency and um, a certain level of humility. I would also say that look for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help because it's remarkable how much help is out there. 
if you reach out. Um, and it's really, I feel incredibly fortunate to have had some really great advocates throughout my career path. Um, and in hindsight is when I really realized what the value was, and I would just really encourage, you know, reach out, there is help there. And then just the last thing, you know, this, this isn't a zero-sum game. Um, the pie is growing. We can, I would challenge each of ourselves to make sure this doesn't look like a set of trade-offs or a zero-sum game. Just expand the pie and try to adopt that mindset. I would say, um, you know, I always tell my students, uh, number one, find your passion. Because, um, you know, find your passion and don't be afraid to work hard. Um, you know, I, I, I truly feel blessed to be in the job that I am as a professor. Um, you know, if I had to change, if I could go back and change my career or, you know, do something different, I would not because I feel like, you know, I'm doing something where I'm passionate and I'm happy to get up in the morning and go to work. And I know that more than 50% of people in this world, and I think I'm probably underestimating that number, more than 50% of people in this world hate getting up in the morning and going to work. And I think that's such a tragedy because we spend more than 50% of our waking time every day being at work. Why would you want to be at work if you hate your work? And that's such a it's terrible existence. And I can't imagine being in that pool and I feel fortunate enough that I'm not one of that 50%. I'm actually on the other side where I love getting up in the morning and going to work. And I, and I, I would say that the reason for that is because I found my passion. And that's what you want to do. You want to find your passion, what keeps you up and wanting you to go back to your work and you really enjoy it, but you have to work hard. You know, I tell my students, don't try to find the easy way out. How can I make my millions the easy way? Doesn't exist. It's not there. You have to work hard. As long as you're willing to work hard and you find your passion, I think success lies there. It's not a zero-sum game, as Seema said. You know, we can keep growing the pie, and all of us can keep becoming better versions of ourselves. And, and you're basically, or you should be competing with your own self. You're not competing with anybody else. Just be the best version of you. And I think that's, that's where we want our women to understand, especially our women, because sometimes as women, uh, we underestimate our potential, and we underestimate what we can do and the power we have within ourselves to be the best version of me. That's what you want to be. And you'll be surprised at how much you can do and how much you can achieve if you're willing to put in the hard work and believe in yourself. And with that, I'd like to thank our panelists today from all uh, ends of the world uh, joining us our roomies and our zoomies, and thank you all for, for being here in such a beautiful audience to be focused on this, this topic and really um, being part of the, I think, the, the surge forward in, in the workforce diversity. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.